welcome to another round of the OAuth Happy Hour. I'm Aaron Parecki, and we have Vittorio here as well. Ciao Thanks a tutti. Joining. How's it going? We are sitting in our nicely air-conditioned spaces now where while the uh, Pacific Northwest is on fire around us. So it's been a hot last couple of days, but everything is um, nice inside here. It is nice inside indeed. The thing that gets a bit unsettling is uh, as the sun starts coming down and it becomes red and you can look at it directly without uh, having uh, your retina burn. It's like, hmm, something is going on in here. But while you are inside, uh, it's manageable. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got... Um... I guess we'll just jump right in. Uh, of course, if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat wherever you are watching. And we will um, talk about stuff if you have questions about it. Otherwise, we've got stuff to chat about as well, just about what's been going on in the world of OAuth. So yeah, I guess let's start with um, seeing if there's been any updates on any of the specs that have been uh, worked on lately. We've got a lot of stuff in the pipeline in the group. Uh, I know there's a lot of work going on with some of the uh, new extensions that, that are uh, being worked on. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just open up the the um, page that shows the draft status. It looks like it's been a bit of a slow summer. Um, but OAuth to push authorization requests that is um, progressing through the IETF chain of process nicely. Uh, I guess it hasn't been, it's been a couple of weeks since the last update, but it's in the editor's queue for, what, is that the last step before it gets an RFC number? I believe it's the last step, uh, but now it, it's still a long one because the RFC editor needs to go and nitpick and put all the bars on the T's and the dots on the I's, uh, all stuff that as technical people, we usually don't uh, pay that much attention, but instead <laughs> we have the editors that are extraordinarily thorough. So that's why it takes a while. Okay. But they, I think that the, the point is the substance, it's now there. So if someone right. decides to implement, the fact that uh, you move the passive to an active voice uh, in a sentence won't really change the implementation that you are doing. So it's safe for people to start playing with, I believe. That is really good news. That's very exciting. I am a big fan of this one. And honestly, I feel like OAuth should have probably always worked this way uh, because of the uh, less reliance on the front channel is a good thing, in my opinion. So. No, <laughs> Mixed no, no I, I, I agree uh, provisionally. Let's <laughs> say that uh, okay. uh, for okay. the things that OAuth is supposed to do, like getting access tokens, and if you do have something which is uh, on the back end, then yeah, like back end uh, is definitely less exposed to all these various manipulations, like these uh, uh, Swiss cheese uh, that is uh, what happens uh, in the user agent. Uh, the thing is that sometimes when you put stuff on top of off, like open connect and similar, then some stuff can be done in the front channel. But I agree, it's more of an exception than the rule. But it's an important exception. That's why I'm being uh, nitpicking. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like if we had always, if it had always worked this way, then there would be a, have been less of a need to do some of those additional band aids to protect the front channel in the other ways, which are. In my opinion, more complicated, and they require more hoops. So it's true. The thing is like that um, makes me uh, reluctant to abandon some of that stuff is that uh, also from a practical perspective, like like when, uh, when you are buying a web space, uh, if you just have like static stuff and then you serve it back and you do stuff on the JavaScript, then you have like a or like you have a mobile app and the code runs on the user's device then you have like less invoices to deal with rather than when you have a backend. Yeah. Uh, so doing something that always requires a backend, I would feel it would not be very um, democratic. But, sure, but if wait. you have a backend, 
then I do agree that uh, we should have made better use of it. We should have given uh, better guidance to people so that uh, they fully take advantage of what can be done on the back end. But there's nothing about push authorization requests that requires a back end. I agree. You I agree. could uh, do it from uh, a JavaScript app or a mobile app. Absolutely. What, what I meant is that uh, the, you are general, like uh, I was still commenting what you said earlier, as in uh, we should use uh, the front channel less uh, and the back channel oh, okay, more. Okay. So okay. it was more in the general terms. In particular, for the par, I think that uh, the added expressive power, regardless of uh, server side or front channel side alone, yeah. is uh, a huge, huge value that, uh, again, alone would uh, give uh, the thrust for this spec to be uh, an important addition to the framework. Yeah, I think it'll well. It's definitely a good uh, a good building block, and it's going to let us do some very very cool things that really wouldn't be practical or even possible without it. So, and now the fun begins for us, as in uh, product people, to go right. to product places and say, "Hey, where is this new thing? Do you have room in your roadmap to get try to get this thing in?" And uh, it's always hard because, of course, we are always at capacity. Uh, but this is an important phase, and uh, I'm confident that uh, the value that is brought by PAR will prove to be a good motivator for this thing to be adopted in the industry. Do you know if there is anyone that already implemented something in that respect? You know, I don't actually know uh, much about the implementation status of this one. Um, Sometimes these, uh, I know it's like a new, uh, it's a recent recommendation from the IETF to put uh, an implementation status section in the draft before it hits uh, RFC status. You take it out of the actual RFC, but um, it looks like it's not in this one. I think it was very recent recommendation, uh, but yeah, it would I be think a... it happens very often. Like I remember yeah. when I was uh, very worried about my own... Uh, uh, my own draft going through the process. And uh, um, the various area directors or the chairs asked before moving it to ISG, roll call, who implemented this thing? And yeah. I was very surprised by the number of people that implemented the draft that I knew nothing about. But uh, okay. as far as I know, that information was only gathered as uh, due diligence by the chairs and uh, the ADs okay. in the list but it never made it anywhere apart from uh, maybe the shepherd write-up, like this thing that the, the, one of the chairs does, when it, like basically writes a recommendation for uh, your draft to being moved from the ITF to the ISG. And I believe that in there, there might be something, but in the draft in itself, like in the spec in itself, uh, I mm -hmm. haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I just remember there's um, there was something that I uh, that went around of like, you should you should be putting an implementation status section as an appendix that gets removed before final publication. But that way, people who are reading the draft, like an early version of the draft, kind of gets a sense of is this something that is super experimental that like two people have built, or is this like pretty widely accepted as what people are going to be building because this is just a sort of formalization of it, or like how experimental is this is this document? So. Uh, but I don't, yeah, I haven't seen that, that many drafts that actually have done it yet. It's a good idea, though. No, it, I agree. It is a very good idea. And uh, it's so hard. Like, uh, here, I'm sure that you stumbled upon uh, um, situations in which uh, people just see a spec and there is an ITF in the path. And then they yeah. automatically think, oh, wow, this is an ITF thing. And then maybe... Yep. It's just someone who had an idea and uh, wrote it down and posted it. But, and then you have to tell them, no, it means very little. Like this person had a thought, decided to put it out for discussion, but until the surname, the last name of this person doesn't disappear from the path, that means like a very, it's not that that means nothing, but there is no backing from the ITF. This is just like a, a, a file repository. And I then, think people, yeah. I feel like people, people don't that. understand that nearly as much as they should. So if you look at, this is all the ones, uh, those are RFCs. 
But if you look at the uh, this section, I, I call them out on this web page separately, but these are individual drafts, which is the name for it, where it's not yet adopted. And these have a person's name, draft and a person's name, whereas all the official ones are draft IETF. And they look the same, but this is just some ideas that Justin has about how to do this that have been probably not actually read by anybody yet, right? So it doesn't actually hold any weight, yet it looks exactly the same as like this one, right? I mean, it's got a few more. Oops. Uh, the uh, short URL broke because of the 2-1 in the URL. It's thinking it's a draft of 2. Yeah. 2-1, I think I have to go and add a version number uh, after it. No, 2. There we go. Anyway, uh, Andrew, that was a bad reveal. Anyway, the uh, you know this one is an IETF draft. Uh, it's not an RFC, so it also has less status than an RFC, but at least it's an IETF draft, whereas this one is an individual draft. And yeah, I feel like people see these floating around and give them far more weight than they are actually uh, due at that stage. Yeah, and this is a classic, uh, classic, classic uh, curse of knowledge because uh, for the typology of people that populates the ITF, the difference is glaring because uh, right. you go and you look at the header and it says status, so how can you not see it? And then you tell, well, well, a lot of the people that uh, want to somewhat be informed about what's happening don't necessarily have the instinct to see It's kind of like a, if you are a chess master, you look at the chessboard and you see configurations. Whereas a far of a man of the street is like a bunch of little thingies uh, on a black and white board. So yeah. um, I believe that uh, like RFC is ancient in the internet. Uh, like it's like one geological era ago. And some things are changing uh, and we are getting up to the times. Like, for example, before you had to write RFCs only using like this uh, Harry Potter enchantment XML that turns into this RFC, which uh, it, honestly, it was one of the biggest uh, steps I had to deal with when I started writing stuff. Yep. And now instead you can write in Markdown, which is a big improvement, or one quintessential characteristic of RFCs are the ASCII art diagrams with little dashes and similar. And those are also relics of an era in which RFCs were written on 80 column green phosphorus screens. But now you can use SFGs. It's still like full of bugs and similar. But anyway, I think that uh, <laughs> we should eventually get to a place in which uh, the status of stuff is uh, has better visual affordances. So when someone lands on the right. screen, it's very clear. I'm not saying just color because some people cannot see color, but some, how uh, to say, uh, accessible way of making glaringly obvious where you are in the states. Like, uh, is this an RFC? Is this uh, a draft uh, that has been adopted by the working group? Yeah. Is this uh, someone who wanted to write down this thing for discussion, but it's still completely individual. We, uh, W3C has a similar process of, you know, they have their own names for it, but it's similar of like, this is a completely random thing from one person. This is something that like a community group makes, which is also essentially no stand, no official standing by the w W3C, but it looks the same as like the, the, um, uh, Rec recommendation is the term for their final status, W3C recommendation. Um, and the templates all look the same. So they will get thrown around as if they do have status when they don't because they all look the same. But they have the same sort of like sequences. And I tried, I'm trying to find an example of it. And I can't find it now, but I tried to um, illustrate that in some of the specs that I was taking through the process uh, because of that exact problem of like, what does it mean when it's a recommendation? That doesn't sound final. That just sounds like a suggestion, right? Uh, so 
it's really not obvious unless you're really familiar with the process um, of of these specs. But hopefully, hopefully, this stuff will get easier to um, to navigate as we make these tools better and make the places we publish them better. I think it's a natural uh, trajectory that uh, this thing just needs to go through because uh, a lot of the people that drove that stuff are people that come from the former generation, like think uh, Oasis, mm -hmm. uh, Cantara, and some of those things were very uh, private clubs. Like they don't mm -hmm. receive to some extent still is. Like uh, the important stuff is done by the members, which pay like uh, 50 grand per year or something like that. So there, there is a, a, but in the past, there was this bar, which was uh, pretty high, as in like on, you'd uh, sit at those tables only if you'd work for a big company, which paid big fees. And so in general, this idea of uh, there are conventions, there are like annotations, things that we agree on and similar, were uh, more viable and they were also like aligned with the kind of processes that were done in the past today we are in a completely different world in which anyone that wants to uh, actually help with the itf with w3c and similar at least like in terms of uh, technical contribution anyone can do it and so yeah. With uh, this, uh, which is an excellent thing, but just to be completely clear. But the point is that now some of this shared context is diluted because uh, someone might just follow a link, uh, sign up for a mailing list, and then start contributing. And so I think that there should be a bit more work on the side of a framework to make things more obvious rather than putting mm -hmm. the onus, the burden on the person to know. Also, because I could, even if we say officially you don't have to pay anything, if it's hard to operate and do things uh, in a way that will be accepted, we are still keeping the bar high, despite of the fact that you no longer have to give any dollars. So my hope is that we'll manage to bring some uh, innovation there. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, that, that reminded me, you, you your tweet earlier today of the XKCD comic of the... Uh, Today, today's comic, ironically, the uh, it's so it's so obvious to us experts that you know the mere mortals must surely know this super technical jargon thing. But in reality, no, no, you're just so deep in the in the world that you forget what it's like on the outside, which yeah. I definitely, definitely uh, sympathize with. It's the famous curse of knowledge, and I think that in our space is one of the worst scourges. Like uh, I, I gave uh, to myself a personal mission across all the companies I work with to try to make identity more digestible for developers. And the thing that I've observed across the board is that uh, identity asks for such an investment to become mm -hmm. a, a domain expert. And it has so many facets and uh, the stakes are so high that very often people end up shipping, uh, like exposing to the developer uh, some lower level uh, aspects, which the developer shouldn't uh, have the need to understand. And somehow it's a, it's a double-edged sword. On one side, you are forsaking responsibility because you are saying, dear developer, here there are all the possible knobs. There is a all the rope mm -hmm. that you want. And uh, if you end up uh, hanging yourself, not my fault. Uh, but on the other, there is also the, what if I provide you with uh, a simplified interface, but the thing that you need, I hid behind some. Uh, uh... And so finding this uh, uh, middle ground in which you enable the developer to do what they want to do, uh, without burdening them with a lot of complexity and still providing a graceful slope for the people that know more and want to customize more. It's uh, the mission of a lifetime. It's like, uh, yeah. I, I, th I don't think we got it yet. We've been steadily improving in the last 15 years. We did huge improvements. We still have uh, an incredible margin to go. 
it is it is tough it's it's a it's a complicated space for many different reasons there's a lot of different players involved that have different interests and it's hard to make a product that fills everybody's needs um but it's yeah i don't know it's it's tough but it's well, a fun it's challenge fun. it's fun <laughs> like where every time there is uh, something that we do that uh, simplifies things i i really feel good like whenever I see like uh, someone that successfully uses, uh, uh, like I remember when we first come out, like the first uh, SDKs that implemented uh, um, the like some on WS Fed, uh, okay, mm -hmm. you connect all stuff in which people could just say, okay, I'm using uh, these development stock. All I need to do is to drop this library, enter these couple of uh, configuration settings, as in uh, this is from where I get my metadata, this is my identifier. That's it. And then behind the scenes, the right thing happened, and the developer didn't have to know anything about it. That was yeah. an amazing moment. And yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, we still have a similar moments in front of us for like uh, more advanced things, like uh, Scheme, uh, Fast Fed, uh, all of these uh, next uh, order of magnitude uh, scenarios where we can really simplify things. Yeah, definitely. I was just uh, doing a workshop this morning for for a customer, and uh, it's I've I've recently uh, finished this sort of helper demonstration tool to help talk about some of the concepts in OAuth, and um, they actually loved it. They got really they got really good feedback. But the one of the things I talk about is like you know explaining the concept of OAuth scopes, and then or Open ID Connect scopes of like what happens when you add this into the request and I'm I'm showing how it gets built on over time and one of that one of those things is I end up needing to do a lot of OAuth flows where I'm going to just start an OAuth flow get an access token or get an ID token see what's inside see what happens when you do x y and z and I uh, put together this page which is actually uh, a real website you can go to it's example-app.com/client and um cuz I realized I was writing this code over and over again like at the workshop. And that wasn't the interesting part. The interesting part is what happens when you do different things with it. So this is a sort of generic OAuth client. You can put in any issuer URL. And as long as that supports the metadata document, uh, this will go find it. You drop in a client ID or a client secret if you are doing, if you want to pretend you're a confidential client. And then you can just start an OAuth flow with any of the scopes. And I'm already logged in, so it's not going to ask me to log in. but you know, it shows you the URL that it built of like, now I can go and explain what these parameters mean. But like, this is the stuff an SDK would be doing. The user's going to click continue. And then I get sent to, oh, I'm not logged in. I get sent to uh, the OAuth server. And then I get sent back to the app. And it's done. It's to finish the flow. And now I can go and talk about, oh, what are the claims inside this? Oh, why don't we have the user's email? That's because I didn't include the email scope here, right? So it's a useful tool, and uh, people loved it today. And they were like, "Is this? Can I just use this for like after the workshop?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, this is just a link. It's online. Feel free to use it. You're welcome to it. It's just a generic OAuth client testing tool, and it is. I will say, it's a lot easier than Postman. I had some people trying to use Postman for this during the exercise today, and Postman's great. Whatever." There's, there's good uses for it, but every time I've tried to help people use it for an OAuth flow or, or teach people something by, by using Postman as the tool, I end up spending more time explaining how Postman works than the thing I'm actually trying to teach. Because you have to explain what environments are and how to set environment variables and why you can override some of them and how the it's just so complicated and it's so not necessary for it to look to be that complicated. And so yeah, yeah, I got fed up with Postman. Be, yeah, it's like uh, they have their own reasons for like, uh, because it's it's a debugging tool, but uh, for this particular scenario, and also the hard thing is that when you are teaching stuff to people, it's very hard to keep uh, separate the Chrome from the content. And yep. so if they're already trying to learn something new, which is off and all these various concepts, and you mix into it uh, things like uh, the idiosyncrasies of a tool that you're using, then uh, 
whatever content the retainer had might end up being like a, either the signal to noise uh, ratio isn't so as crisp, or they might mistake as uh, things that apply to everyone, things that happen to right. be only peculiarities of a postman. So yeah, that's great. That uh, That's a great tool. That looks great. Yeah, it's fun. So yeah, we've got um, push authorization requests. So that's the only movement in the spec world recently, I guess. Uh, it is, you know, the the month where Europe takes a vacation, and maybe we should learn something from that in the U.S. But nobody's uh, nobody's doing anything over over there right now. Just enjoying the summer. So not a lot of other uh, updates, I feel like. Yeah, they, this thing is, um, I have to say that uh, as a European uh, that has been spending 15 years in the States, um, I actually prefer the way it works in here because uh, there, oh, really? when August shows up, like I can't speak on behalf of entire Europe, but in Italy, everything grinds to a halt. In fact, like I've learned not to go back to Italy in vacation in August because like typically when you go, you go to the various shops where you find things that you cannot find. Mm -hmm. in and there, everything is absolutely closed. All of the factories are closed at the same time. So all the workers of the factories are on the road or they are on the beach. So if you want to uh, do anything that is business related, Unless the business is going to a gelateria or to a restaurant, then <laughs> the, like you just needed to resign yourself. But no, it cannot yep. be done. And on one side, it's also nice because I like, could hear whenever you go on vacation, unless it's Christmas or Thanksgiving, you know that Slack might have something for you. And so right, uh, if right. you are a bit anxious or if you are dependent on the endorphin spike when you see an update, uh, then it might be hard to completely relax. So it's good when there is a, but you know that everyone else is out. So you don't have to worry about getting, but still. No pressure of being the only one who's who's not working right now because you know that everybody is off. Yeah. Except, except, yeah, yeah absolutely. I have that problem for sure. I definitely don't. Uh, it's why I, I don't take long breaks during the year because I have that problem of like, I don't want, to be not responding to emails for three weeks because it means I'm going to have a huge backlog when I come back because everybody else is busy working. And uh, I I just, yeah. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying I'm making a smart decision here, but this is just how I feel. <laughs> no, I, I completely sympathize. And the other thing is, it's not just the backlog. It's that sometimes think things happen in that time frame. And then that's it, decision right. is made and you have to live right. with it. And in fact, like uh, one famous, uh, well, famous, one anecdote which I relay in uh, one of my books is that uh, um, once the, the, while I was still in Microsoft, there was a team that was deciding the name of the middleware used for validating uh, a JWT tokens in uh, API calls. And uh, um, I was uh, vacationing in Fiji in a very small, gorgeous, absolutely amazing island. It was very close to where they shot uh, um, Castaway. It was that far from civilization. And they had internet 15 to 20 minutes a day when the satellite just uh, had uh, for like uh, a very oh. right angle. And so my calls uh, were like, uh, I had to do everything. It was 15, 20 minutes. So long story short, they picked the name for that class and I don't know if it's still true, but back in the day, it was the longest name in the entire uh, .NET framework. It was really, really long. And if I would have been part of a discussion, it would not have been that long. <laughs> like, uh, I, uh, I know that there is intelligence and similar, but this is like, a, I, I will fish it out just to put it in the notes, but it would not have been this long. But anyway, I think that that class is now that long because uh, I was vacationing in a place without the internet. So That's it's not a backlog. It's like I just missed yeah. the magic moment for that decision. That is really funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, 
so what else is what else is going on uh in this world i um not to like feature octa's product launches but i did i am very excited about this personally that octa shipped the device grant in uh early access right now and right. this is something that is near and dear to my heart because I, I talk about it all the time in my workshops and have not been able to actually let customers use it because it hasn't existed and i've always been like you can sort of just fake it by setting up a little thing over here if you want to that does the device flow bits but now it's built in to the product and it is going live uh, officially live live later but it's in early access and you can go turn it on if you have an account you can go in there and like push the button to turn it on for for you to give it a shot uh i'm very excited about that very nice the um congratulations we should yeah we should show the device grant i don't have a uh oh yeah i do have a little so this is the OAuth Playground, which is also a fun little tool I wrote a while ago, um, OAuth.com slash Playground. But this is a simulation of the different flows. So you can see the requests and responses for each of the flows. And one of them is the device code. So it shows you how it works. It walks you through it step by step. Um, it shows what's the first step that the device does. It goes and talks to the device endpoint, sends its client ID, starts the flow and then it gets this response and it's uh this tool it's all faked but it's all like random strings and all that so it's kind of cool um gets the uh long secret one that it holds on to it gets the one that it shows the user it gets a url to show the user and uh oh hey i can update this sentence now this is great i had to put a disclaimer that octa doesn't actually support it uh so i can update that now but the idea is the device is supposed to show that short URL and the code to the user somehow. Um, you see this on like an Apple TV all the time too, where it's like you log into some cable app and it's going to have you go and actually finish the login on your phone where you can actually type things in faster. Um, but so you'll, you'll go to that URL, enter the code. And then um, as far as the device is concerned, it's just sitting there polling the, t the regular token endpoint saying, hey, I've got this long secret device code here has the user finished logging in yet and eventually uh, eventually they will finish logging in and when you pull again you get back an access token and the flow is done uh, and it's kind of a fun demo of the of the device flow very, and, very yeah. nice and now I would be uh, I would say People would tell me that I should have done it if I don't do it now. I have right. to send you the link to the uh, device the playground uh, that we also uh, have with zero. So uh, I, I just sent you, I sent you the link in Slack if you just want to flash it. Uh, uh, great. Basically, it's like uh, no need to go for it, but it's the same idea. It's a part of our documentation. Oh, but it's going to go do a real, real flow, right? It's going to actually. Use... I believe it's actually doing it. Yes. So if I use my my tenant, which I think is that, although the client ID is wrong, is it going to? Yeah, if, if you oh, don't use the okay. client yeah, yeah, ID, yeah. it's gonna um, it's gonna complain. But I think that the, there is a way of signing in with your uh, user. It actually have this done all as part of that. And also, okay. I think that the, in our quick starts, if you are signing in with your user. The code in the quick start will be adapted. Mm. Your, uh, and you can say, I want to use this particular client, and then it just changes everything to, to reflect it. So it gives you like a good uh, good got starting it, point. It. And one thing to mention that probably I shouldn't because uh, it's a secret, but uh, uh, we had a lot of fun recording uh, our uh, um, session for the developer day, yes. which is coming later this month. And uh, we do spend some time talking about the device flow. So we have like a, a bit of context, a bit of history. We have a little diagram which shows how this thing goes. So if you want to dig a bit deeper about like the mechanics of how it works, we, we don't have a lot of time, so we don't go much into the details, but we do touch on it. So uh, I'd say more reasons to join uh, the developer day, which in itself will have lots of interesting sessions. Yeah. Let's Talk about that real quick. This is uh, Okta and Auth Zero's Developer Day, uh, August 24th, virtual event. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of good talks, a lot of good speakers here. 
Uh, some of the speakers are from Okta and Auth0. Some of them are guest speakers. And uh, we have breakout sessions from a lot of very cool people. Um, this is the agenda with all the talks. Here is our session. So that was a that was a lot of fun to record. These are these are all pre-recorded talks, but they're broadcast all live like during these times, um, and there'll be like a chat during the session and all that too. So we'll yeah, be hanging out there online. during yeah. the chat to answer questions um, about the session. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Closing keynote, Cassidy Williams. I'm sure that will be great. Um, and the second day, uh, the next day is a full day of labs, which is uh, five five different sessions. These are still I have to fill these out with the descriptions. But we've got OAuth oh, Nobody Connect. We've got an Auth Zero session. We've got uh, Terraform. We've got JFrog doing DevOps and uh, Kong doing uh, an API security workshop. These are basically 90 minute sessions that are instructor led and they are um, meant to be hands on activities. So you, you, like show up expecting to do stuff, like come ready to build an app and follow along the tutorials. There will be sets of instructions for all of those provided during the sessions. Um, and again, we'll have people in the chat to, to help answer questions as well. Uh, both of these are free, so no cost to attend. Come and hang out and uh, enjoy enjoy the session. Nice. Yeah, that's very exciting. I'm really looking forward to uh, actually do it. It's, uh, and I think that for the labs, you guys did an excellent job. It's one of the best ways of uh, learning. Because like, uh, when you just mm -hmm. hear content, uh, even if you understand, it's kind of like uh, understanding a language or speaking it. Uh, yeah. When you like read and say, oh yeah, I, know, I now know it. And then when you try to speak, you discover that ah, not as much. And so trying to do it while you have available someone in chat to which you can ask your question, the moment it emerges, it's one of the most efficient ways of learning. Because like, it's just like a, a hole opens up in your understanding and you plug it immediately with the correct knowledge. It's the absolute yeah, best way yeah. of learning something. Yeah, and it's gonna be it's a it's great doing those two together because the first day is all the presentations and like you know get excited about the stuff, learn some some new stuff in in small chunks, and then you get to apply it the next day. So you can actually go and get get your hands on some actual coding or configuring or whatever you want to call it. They're not all even coding exercises, which I think is also cool. Um, it's not all about code slimes. It's about ops and different configuration files and stuff. So yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's soon. Like um, it is. It's like yeah. two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. less than two weeks because today is less than two weeks. So yeah, it's, it's on uh, Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah, Tuesday um, and Wednesday in two weeks from now. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, uh, coming up fast. I've still got some stuff to prepare. Even though the talks are, even though our talk is done and recorded, uh, there's still more to do. And uh, I'm setting stuff up for the developer day at labs to make sure those go all smoothly. Um, some of those are going to be pre-recorded. Some of them are going to be live. So maybe you'll know which is which, or maybe not, because uh, <laughs> I'm not planning on telling people ahead of time. <laughs> Yeah, I have to say that during the during COVID, uh, the pre-recorded uh, format happened a lot of times. Like uh, mm -hmm. Idaniverse, uh, like a lot, like RSA for many many conferences, big and small, uh, end up having to do like pre-record and then be available during the broadcasting yeah. in the Q and A, and it's always a bit surreal to hear yourself speak and uh, being able to comment just like part of the audience on what's going on. And yeah. it, it's interesting. Uh, it has its uh, advantages, but at the same time, it can also be very frustrating because uh, uh, you are never fully happy with uh, how you do stuff. You can always improve. And this stuff is like slapped in your face. But yeah, you should have said X. Right, right. And sometimes things change. Like uh, many of the sessions I did were about uh, 
browser changes uh, and oh. how you impact the identity. And those things change the, from week to week. And very yeah. often, the uh, organization of a conference would ask you to record months in advance. And you tell them, hey, like people will see the light of a star, but the star already detonated. <laughs> so it's kind of like uh, there is a two months, like two months is too much for this topic, which of course I always use the, as an excuse to be late because uh, as a good South European, I like to be <laughs> late. Yep. Well, cool. Yeah, definitely join us for Developer Day. Uh, I know a lot of people are putting a lot of work into it, so hopefully it's uh, hopefully it's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, looking forward to being in the chat, hanging out with everybody, doing the labs. Um, I I'm doing one of the I'm doing the OAuth workshop, the OAuth lab. So I'll have some activities there uh, to try stuff out, get get um, get some experience configuring an OAuth server. We'll talk about what you know, what different access token lifetimes mean for different things and uh, how to how to do all that. Um, it's going to be some of the content's going to be similar to the things I do in the the private workshops that I do. So you'll get a nice little sneak peek into what I do uh, that is not broadcast publicly normally. Um, but yeah. Be... Now it will make me really curious about what is that you are uh, holding back. That oh yeah, yeah. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not that I don't normally say. It. It's just that, you know, it's things that most of the stuff that's, that I have out there that's public is like uh, in the conference talk format, which is just a very different way of talking than if I've got three hours in front of a group of people. It's oh, just yeah. a different, a different way of, of of talking to people. So, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we're rounding out, getting close to the top of the hour. I guess we could wrap up here. Uh, I feel like it's a good way to close out. Um, let me just put the developer day uh, slide up again. Definitely um, want to make sure people know about that. Uh, again, it is free. It is free. Just uh, register for the sessions on the first day. You can just show up for the labs, you don't need to register for those. We're going to broadcast those on YouTube, um, or not YouTube, sorry. We're broadcasting them on the website, which is um, linked from this page. Uh, and they will just, if you just show up here on this website, that is where they will be on the day of. And you don't need to register ahead of time. You can just show up and join. Um, and it will be a lot of fun. And so, we don't have any more uh, happy hours between, between now and the Correct. Um, we are not doing one next week. And then we'll be doing the developer day. So this is the last one uh, before for developer day. Yeah, and September is going to be complicated because like there is uh, Labor Day. And then there yeah. is uh, the European Identity Conference, which happens right after, which is followed by the Identity Week. So uh, in terms of identity events, uh, uh, we love to play a jigsaw puzzle to yep. find uh, the time to do the uh, to do the happy hour. But I'm sure that we'll uh, maybe we'll be in different time zones, but uh, I'm sure that we'll manage. And in, in any case, there'll be some uh, fun stuff to talk about after those events. So absolutely, yep. yeah. All right. Well, All right. thank. You you everybody for watching and thank you Vittorio for joining and you uh, if you want to know when the next happy hour is coming up make sure you subscribe here on YouTube or Twitch uh, and go check out octadev.events if you want to um, see the schedule or add it to your calendar and with that have a great rest of the day and we will see you next time Ciao, ciao.